Solomon wrote, it's because of God's mercies that we're not destroyed. And I have hope because his compassions, they fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Awesome song that we sing here for you. Amen. The Lord is my inheritance, and therefore I will hope in him. See, that's where hope comes from. It's in him. The Lord is good to them that wait for him and to those that seek him. And it is good that we should both hope and quietly wait. Hope and wait for the salvation of the Lord. Because all things work together for good. But sometimes it's that waiting. It's that in between that uh, we struggle with. But God has a plan and a purpose in all of that. I remember years ago I went to pray for a lady uh, in the hospital. And she was near death with cancer. And as I walked into the room, the daughter uh, said, Jim, I want to ask you something. He said, I know you believe in God and miracles and healing, but please don't get her hopes up. And I thought, okay. And I walked away from that day, and I thought, no, that's wrong. That's our job as ministers of God's grace and good to get people's hopes up. Jesus came as the hope of Israel, and he's our blessed hope, and if people don't have hope, it's one of the scariest places that you could ever be. Paul talked about that in Ephesians. He said, there are people in this world, they're without God, they're aliens from all of the promises of God, without hope in the world. And if there is no hope in the world, it's a very frightening and lonely and discouraging place to be. We have to get our hopes up, and I want to talk to you about how to do that today. Because Christ living in us is our hope of glory. I mean, without Christ, there'd be no hope of ever getting to heaven. We don't get there because we're good. You, you don't get there by keeping the commandments, by giving money to the church, by attending church. Um, it's not because of us. So our hope and all of our hope about heaven and glory has to be based in him. Christ in us is the reason we have a hope to share his glory. And another place Paul was talking to the church at Ephesus, and he said, do you remember when you were without Christ? Remember, look back at the time in your life when you didn't know Christ as a Savior. Remember where you were? You've been there. You were strangers. You had no familiarity, no knowledge uh, from the covenants of God's promise or the word that he has. You were without hope in the world. And I've seen a lot of instances of cases in my life where people just give up hope. They have no hope. But even for the believer facing cancer or death, we have a hope of eternal life. And there's a reason to uh, uh, keep our faith and trust in God. We've all been to that place in our life where our hope has been shattered or damaged and, and we feel alone or discouraged. How many of you have ever driven your car into the ditch beside Kim? And Jim. Is your car still there, Kim? No. Here's the important thing about driving in the ditch. Don't stay there. I remember a time when I hit some slush on one of those uh, four leaves here going into Cedar Falls, threw my car sideways, and I'm sliding down this hill of snow backwards. Oh, 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 oh. And Nothing you could do, just let it happen. I just praying I didn't roll over, but I slid silently down to the bottom. And um, while I'm sitting there pouting, uh, a maintenance driver who had uh, was pushing snow, he pushed the slush to the middle of the road. He said, I'm sorry, but I have to push it to the middle. And then before I can push it off, I goes, I know. He said, are you going to be okay? Yeah. You want me to call somebody? No, I've got a cell phone. And so I sat there and pouted for a while, but then I called for help and I had somebody pull me out. I went on. We've all had those places in our lives. The important thing, yeah, we're going to pout, we're going to regret, we're going to pity me for a while, but don't stay there. If you have to get help, get out of that place. Because God wants us to get our hopes up. I want you to get your hopes up. Uh, Jehovah, Father God, is the God of all hope. He's the source of hope, and, and we get it from him. We're going to see that in scriptures today, because he wants to fill you. Paul told the church in Rome, Now may the God of hope fill you up with all joy and peace 
in believing so that you might abound, overflow in hope. See, if you want to get to a place of hope and confidence in your life, it starts with believing and uh, having joy and peace that comes only from God. And only then can we abound in hope and have it not only live and dwell in us, but flow out from us. And others, you know, I've, I've seen, and I'm sure you have two people in the midst of some terrible circumstances, and they're still happy and they're still smiling. And it's like, how can you smile at a time like this? How can you be happy? Because they have that peace on the inside. It's all going to work out for good. And because of their confidence in the Lord, peace abounds and it shows and it flows out from their lives. And you have to have some kind of hope uh, in God and something better in order to receive from God. I want to describe that process. Here's a scripture you're all familiar with in Hebrews. It says, faith is the substance, the foundation of the things that we're hoping for. <clears throat> and it's the evidence of the things that we don't see yet. Because he said, if you can see it, why would you hope for it to happen if it's already happened and you see it? Uh, um, so hope comes ahead of believing and having faith and receiving. See, for example, how many of you got up this morning and you're, you were hoping your car would start? How many of you got up this morning believing that your car would start? See? You had a hope. You could lay there in bed all morning. I, well, I hope my car starts. Well, it probably won't. I don't know if it'll start or not. And there's no use going out there. There's no use trying it. It won't start. And if you have a hope or desire for something to happen, you have to believe it. Then you have to get up and act on it and do something. And you can sit there in the car in front of your steering wheel and say, well, I hope my car starts. Boy, I've come this far. I, I hope it'll start now. No, it's not going to start on its own. You either got to turn the key or push the button. Or some people have a remote start on their key fob. It takes all of those things to make something happen. But it starts with hope, and that's followed up by what you believe, and then you act on it. See, how many of you hope to make it to heaven? Hopefully all of us want to get there. But you can hope and hope and hope and hope if you don't believe it. If you don't act on it and do something about it, it's not going to happen. Salvation starts with hope. You have to have a hope. You know, I've talked with some people who say, well, I've lived a life so bad, I, I don't think God could ever forgive me. I don't God would take me. See, here's the thing about salvation. You don't have to get cleaned up or to get better or get your act together to come to God to find salvation. He takes people just like they are. I mean, how many of you had a little child that messed up in his diaper, and you looked at that kid and said, you need to clean up your act before I put a new one on you. I mean, they can't do it themselves. They're not going to do it. So God will take you just like you are. If we as earthly parents are willing to take care of our kids in the middle of their mess, how much more is the Heavenly Father going to take people right where they're at and bring them up to fellowship with Him? Salvation starts with the hope that yeah, anybody who comes to Jesus, he said, I will in no wise cast out. Everybody who receives me, I give them the right, the privilege to become a child of God. You have to not just hope to be saved, but you have to believe the promises that he gave and then start to act on them. See, Romans said we are saved by hope. Then in Ephesians it said we're saved by grace through faith. And now, how come they're different? Because they're all parts of the same process. It starts with a hope, and then we have to have faith that believes it, and then we act on it and confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord, but then we only receive it by grace. It's a gift. Can't buy it, can't earn it. All of those things are important in receiving from God. See, First Peter made a similar statement, and he said, our faith and hope has to be in God. People who trust in themselves end up getting disappointed because we all fall short. And, um, we've made some mistakes. I've made some pretty big ones in my life. But I still have a hope that, and confidence that God is working in me and through me and has a plan for my life. You know, the title of this lesson was Get Your Hopes Up. So I want to tell you how to do that. 
what is it that gives substance, you know? If you're hoping to be, live a better life, if you're hoping to overcome some situation, if you're hoping to have peace with God, here's how it comes. Here's the first step. David learned this way back in Psalms. I will meditate in thy word, the written word. I will meditate in your word upon which you have caused me to hope. See, hearing the word of God, reading the word of God, Getting it on the inside of you is an important first step to the most important part, which is to meditate on it. Think about it. What does this mean? How does this apply to me? How can I act on this? See, it's more than just hearing. You know, Paul said in Romans, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But that's just the first step. I mean, how many of you told your kids to do something and they don't do it, Jody? Nobody counts. Yeah, you don't count because it's way too many. So we hear the word and the majority of people don't respond. They don't obey. And so if we want salvation, the first way to get your hopes up is to meditate on the word of God. Find out what a scripture for what you want and start to meditate on it over and over. There's a man in the Bible, a great man by the name of Abraham. Uh, up into his 90s, had no children. God promised him a child. He said... You will be the father of many nations. The descendants that you have will be like the stars in the sky and the sand in the sea. And he waited and he waited and he waited and no kids, no kids. Finally he had a child, a miracle child. When he was 99 years old, Sarah was 90. And they had a child, Isaac, and they watched that child grow up. And when he was 12 years old, God said, I want you to take your son Isaac, go out to the mountain, Calvary, the same mountain where Jesus died. I want you to go out to Mount Moriah. I want you to sacrifice your son there for me. Abraham said, but God, your promise was I would be the father of many nations. This is my only child. And now you ask me to sacrifice him like a lamb on that altar. And so he took fire. He had Isaac even carry the wood like Jesus carried the cross. And he took the fire along and he took a knife. And he... Uh, laid his son on that altar of wood. He raised the knife. But in Romans, it tells us why he was able to do that. Because as he raised the knife, the angel spoke to him, don't do that. Um, I have a ram over here in the thicket that I want you to use for sacrifice. But I wanted to know that you were willing to give up everything that you had to obey me. I wanted to know that I was first in your life. And here's why Abraham could do that even when he didn't understand it in Romans. <clears throat> he got a picture of what he wanted to happen. He got a picture of these many nations. He saw a picture of the stars in heaven. He saw the sands on the sea. And he said, that's going to be my descendants. That's how many lives are going to come forth from Sarah and I. And he says he received the promise, he believed the promise, he believed that God was able to raise up Isaac from the dead. Lord, if you're asking me to sacrifice him and to kill him, I believe that you're strong enough, you're able to raise him from the dead, which God did later with his own son. But it says, here's the important part. He believed that God was able to do that he believed that God was able to raise up Isaac from the dead, and says, and he received that, and he could see that picture in his mind. He received that in a figure, in a picture. Here's an important thing to receive from God. See in your mind, see in your spirit, see a picture of what you want to happen. Not your son laying on the altar, not the knife being raised to kill him, not the fire in the wood. Get a picture of God raising him up from the dead. You've got to see beyond the problem and see the answer and see what you want to have to happen. Because nothing is impossible with God. In fact, God said this about mankind in, in Genesis chapter 11. Now, it was in a bad way, but it's true in the good as well. Because we're created in the image of God. And God looked down and he saw the wickedness of these people building a tower unto the skies or in honor of the skies or an attempt to get to God some other way. 
and God saw the wickedness and he, he said he's going to destroy these people because he said nothing that they have imagined to do is impossible for them. We're created in God's image. And when God sees a picture or has a plan of what he wants to do, things happen. It, it, it happens. We're created in his image. And that should be true for the children of God. If we see and if we can get a picture of what God wants to do in and through our lives, if we can see that picture, God will bring it to pass. Here's the problem for us. There's two pictures you can look at. Abraham could look at Isaac laying on the altar, or he could get a picture of God raising him from the dead. He chose to look at the picture believing God's able to raise him from the dead. I don't understand why I'm here, but I believe God's going to work it out for good some way. See, despair comes from looking at a picture that's based on the lies of the devil. Hope comes from looking and seeing a picture based on the word of God and the promises of God. If you're sick, get a picture and see yourself healed. If you're unemployed, see a picture of yourself working. If you're disappointed and discouraged, get a picture of yourself happy and content. You've got to see, because as long as you focus on the problem, you're never going to inherit the future. You've got to get your eyes up. It's like, how many of you drive your car while you're staring at the steering wheel? I'm just hoping I'm going the right way, and it's out there. You have to look where you're going. Because as long as you look down, well, I hope I don't run out of gas. I hope my transmission don't go out. I hope I don't have electrical failure. As long as you keep your eyes on the problem, you're not going to get where you want to go. You have to look and get a picture of the future. Now, once in a while, we look in the rearview mirror to see and remember what's happened past. <clears throat> but if you want to know the importance comparably, look at the size of the rearview mirror compared to the size of the windshield. Spend a whole lot more time looking forward than you spend looking backwards. Occasionally we look back, but our primary goal is to look forward to see what we want to happen. Because the picture that you focus on, the thing that you focus on over and over again, is what will come to pass. Because the picture that you focus and meditate on is what you'll end up believing will happen. And then we either act in faith or we act in fear. Believing that, oh, like Job, the thing that I fear has come to pass in my Because he worried about that all of the time. Because if you're looking at Satan's picture all the time, fear is a spiritual force that makes the lies of the devil come true. We have to get a picture of what we want to happen and not focus on what's happening in the world. Because if we focus on what's happening in the world, Pretty soon all we see is what Satan's doing in our lives and, and it overshadows us and, and we feel like we can't get out of it. We're in a tough spot. But what God wants us to do is look at him. Because if we look to Jesus, he who starts with that, looking to Jesus, who's the author, that means he gives it, he initiates it, and the finisher, the developer, who grows and matures our faith. It comes from him. He's the author and developer of that. And if we look to him, faith brings it to pass. So if you look at the lies of the devil, all you see is what the devil's doing. But if you look at the Lord, he becomes clearer and clearer and more and more real and distinct in your life. And if you keep your eyes on Jesus, the problems fade away. It's so important to discipline our minds, to meditate on the good things of God that we want to happen, not the bad things. Here's a little simple example. The process that I put in uh, your bulletin, put it on your mirror, or your refrigerator, or your desk or something. Because if you want to change something, here's the process. Identify the problem. Decide we want to change this. I encourage people, write down the thing that you fear. Write it down, put it on paper, <clears throat> and then tear it up. Don't stay looking at it, tear it up, burn it. Uh, I've even done some seminars where I have people write it down, I put it in a bowl and we burn them. But tear it up, throw it away, get rid of it. Renounce that discouragement. See, use your mouth, use your eyes to 
and your mind to focus on Jesus, then use your mouth. Satan, you're a liar. I will not listen to your lies of discouragement anymore. I refuse to continue looking at this picture of, of what you have and what you want. And then get your hopes up. See, <clears throat> I've got a, a card I made here. I've got a picture on both sides. The two pictures that I had on the screen. Here's the deal. How many sides can I look at at the same time? Just one. So if I'm looking at the devil and I see bad things happening, the rest of you are saying, Jim, what's the problem? Uh, oh, see, the side that you look at and focus on is what you're going to think about, meditate on, and eventually act on. So get a picture of what you want and focus on that. Or write down what you want. You know, I had you write down your fears. Write down what you want from God. Rich does that every week. You know, we have a prayer list. Write down what you want from God. Believe that. Act on that. And receive that. That's God's plan. Um, <clears throat> then you build a frame for it. Faith is what gives substance to your hopes. Start out with some hopes. Add some faith, and that gives substance. Lord, I believe. Confess it. Say it. Act on it. Because your words and your actions will keep your mind from running away. I'm going to show you why that's important in the next slide. And then you pour in the Word of God. Get more of God's Word. Pour in what you want from God's Word. And then pray it and say it and do it and act on it. And then you can wait on God and wait for His answer. Uh, keep your hopes up. Our hope is in what the Word says. Here's an example. For several years, we had a big crack out here in a piece of sidewalk. And uh, an old tree root had raised it up about two inches. And I've stumbled on it. And other people have stumbled on it. So when we were doing some work, I said, let's get rid of that old piece of sidewalk there. So we could think about it. We could hope and pray and, and wish all we wanted. But there was only one way to resolve the problem. Number one, tear up the old. Get rid of the old one. And so we come in there with sledgehammers and tools and dug up the old, carried that off, and got that away. Then the next thing we just build a frame. It has to be an outline. Faith is the substance, the framework for the thing that you're hoping for. So we build a framework. This is what we want. This is where we want this to go, and this is what we want to happen. We made a framework. And then we poured in um, the Word of God. We poured in the concrete. We poured in what we wanted to see, and uh, the frame held it there together, our faith held things together, and we waited for it to get hard and to get settled, and uh, then we could take the frame away, uh, because it's there now, it's fixed, and it's permanent, and it'll stand there on its own. A real practical example of what you want, what you hope for, you build a framework with the Word of God, find some scriptures that'll hold it and keep your mind from wandering all over. See, we couldn't just pour the concrete in there. It would have just run all over. So we had a framework for what we wanted. And you've got to discipline your mind or it'll run all over the place. Oh, this is going to happen. I don't, this will never. And Satan will take you all over the place if you don't have a framework based on the Word of God. You know, here's our whole point of this lesson. Keep looking to Jesus. Who is the Word? Look to the Word. Look to Jesus. He's the author. He's the developer of our faith. And it starts with hope. Faith gives substance to the thing that we're hoping for. And then God brings it to pass. Jesus said, according to your faith, be it unto you. I want to challenge you. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the Word of God, this incredible hope that we have to know that not only our sins are forgiven, but the steps of the righteous are ordained and planned by the Lord. Lord, we see unexpected things happen. We're in a hostile world, and there's collateral damage, and sickness and disease uh, seems to run rampant in so many cases because Satan's out to kill, to steal, destroy but greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And no matter what he throws at us, we believe that 
Our Heavenly Father loves us, cares for us, has an incredible plan. And he sent his son Jesus to reveal that plan to us. And then it's all written down in scriptures in this new covenant so we can know and use that to build a framework for what we're thinking, what we're believing, and what we're saying and what we're doing. Lord, help us to build and immerse ourselves in the word so that our framework is solid and strong and steadfast and secure. Lord, I thank you for these promises, and I pray that you'll help each one of us to keep our eyes on Jesus. Not the problem, not the steering wheel, not the ditch, not the disease, to keep our eyes on Jesus. I believe that, and all of you who receive that, say, Amen.